YouTube, folks. It's your friendly spear of the Wolf Bushwickin, aka your girl Hazel. Um, I am bringing you another video. Uh, let's see if I can set you in the vise here. Hopefully, you can see. I'm gonna try to set you up. Before I put you in the vise, I am gonna show you what I'm doing. I, I thought I'd bring you along. I got to get a new idle or a new bar adjustment adjuster because I accidentally snapped that one and luckily I had a spare saw. This is a 1010, but it should be basically the same adjuster. Just have to take it out and swap. Eventually I'll get a new adjuster for that, a correct one. Put it in there because I do want to fix up this 1010 eventually. But for now I'm fixing up this 210 auto. I'll, I'll move this. So I thought I'd bring you along for a little wrench and vid. I did the video on the unknown radio, which should be up on my channel as well. But let's take you on a little wrench and. Oh, sorry, my hand was over it. I wondered why that. Let's take you on a little wrench and quest with me. Let's see what we can get done see if we can get that bar at the right tension and uh, I will show you what I did afterwards Those of you who are currently working on a saw like this see what I'm doing now so I will show you what I'm about to do and this is applies for all chainsaws pretty much they all have this I don't know if the style or the cyst setup it ha in the modern chainsaws they still have the, um this right here I don't know if you can see it but see that adjuster nub that setup they basically have that in all these older chainsaws that I the modern chainsaws still have something like that but I don't know if it's a slightly different or made of plastic maybe instead of aluminum but you can clearly tell that's I believe is aluminum metal so yeah that thing and you can see I snapped it there by mistake a pretty straightforward system you don't want too much tension on your chainsaw bar you just want enough tension on it so it's tight enough but not to the point where you can't spin the chain so keep that in mind when you're doing that also uh, keep in mind if you get a vintage saw like this that you're not going to want to uh, run this in real long periods of time or heavy this is a good saw if you're like cutting a little bit of wood for your property and and maybe trimming a few trees small smaller trees but a saw like this size is not you'd want a bigger one if you're going to do real like bigger trees and being as vintage as this size too you might not want to run it for super long periods of time they're durable and good saws these old ones but they can tend to overheat because of the age and you know parts wear out over time so just keep that in mind and you want to make sure your mixture is correctly in these and I believe uh, you might want to look this up I'm not a hundred percent sure but I'm pretty sure that these old McCullers are a 40 to 1 ratio versus a 50 to 1 ratio but I could be wrong on that I definitely look that up and don't quote me but if I remember correctly looking up these are a 40 to 1 ratio versus a 50 to 1 ratio and these are uh, surprisingly quite a uh, rare saw if, if you find these these are quite rare that's why I'm hanging on to this one too and I'm going to try to make this one run as well eventually because th these are rare saws and hard to come by I like the 1010 because it has the brake arm the brake lever so the minute you release that the blade stops versus this one does not have that because basically what this one is is just a stripped down version of the 1010 
Uh, I don't know what year these are, but these could have been made the same year. For all I know, these are two different saws I acquired at two different times, not from the same person. So, you know, you don't know that, but still, basically, throughout the 70s when they were making the 1010, they were making the 210 as well, but that was just a stripped down version of the 1010. The 1010 has a slight bit more power and a slight bigger bore, uh, CC cubic inch bore, but the uh, 2-10, again, like I said, is not, is just a stripped down version. It's not as powerful and it doesn't have this fancy uh, brake system that you hold when you want to make the saw when you want oh, this system right here you want to hold when you want the saw to run that you hold at a certain angle and I believe the minute you let this go it automatically breaks it and shuts the bar down so stops it which is a good safety feature and it's a shame they didn't do it in the smaller ones but it is what it is so anyways uh, let's get into the saw repair so what I'm gonna do and I'm going to finish taking these off because I want to get the uh, I want to get the uh, little um, chain the uh, bar adjuster out of there so I can swap them over. And like I said, eventually I'll find a bar adjuster for this to replace or find the correct one for this if that one's fine with that, just so I can have one for this too because I do want to get this saw running because I think this saw has a slight horsepower. Uh, another thing to note on these is there's a little switch at the top. This one clicks in. Uh, it's not a start or stop switch. On these two tens, because they have a high compression ration, there's a black knob at the top and you push that in and it's supposed to uh, release some of the compression so it's easier to pull over when you're starting it versus this is just an on and off switch. So that's what that is. And then on the 1010 you have a, a throttle and a choke as well as they're both located pretty much in the same spot but the 1010 didn't have the doesn't have the uh, uh, decompression switch it just has a stop button that shuts it off automatically when you flip the swap stop if your kill switch is working correctly and it, uh, the 1010 also has a locking switch I'll show you that right there so when you push that in you can lock down your throttle and that just so when you pull it over it's automatically locked and then you can release it once you have the throttle set where you want it the 210 did not have that on those models uh, just basically that's why they put the decompression on there is because the because this thing is lesser horsepower and double the compression it because it, it has so much compression they had to dim it down see the faster you make them the sometimes the less compression they have in the cylinder because you, they're bored more out more to be faster from the factory so they're going to tend to have a little the compression ratio is not going to be the same that's what i'm trying to say because it's bigger saw wider open I believe is how that works quote me if I'm wrong but I'm pretty sure that's how that works I'm kind of new to chainsaws myself but from what I read that's pretty much so anyways uh, in order to take this piece off I don't know if you can see it this is kind of heavy but look at those nuts right there I started on thread uh, I'll show you one in my hand these so when you go to do your bar, these are the nuts right here. I don't know if you can see that. Let me pull that. See that nut? You have two of those. And uh, that's what holds your bar on. On the case of the 210, as you can see, the recoil is on the bar side with the clutch. And the flip wheel's on the other side versus the 1010 has the the recoil on the flywheel side so keep that in mind they're two different saws it's pretty straightforward but you know that's how you can tell they vary and and again that, that's more proof of the stripped down version of it they just went cheapo and smacked the recoil right in with the uh, bar and chain clutch 
which in, in essence does kind of the same thing, but you know, it's just a cut and cost because it basically the 210 back in the day was like a homeowner saw and the 1010 was like a homeowner saw borderline uh, commercial like landscapers type saw. And then you had, I believe there were some other models that were, uh, I'm trying to think of the other models' names that were above the 1010 that you could get at the time that were getting into the commercial, like, landscaper range. But I believe the 1010 back in the 70s was, like, the base model landscaper range. So a little bit better saw versus the 210. Not that the 210 isn't a good saw, just the fact that you know, it, it it doesn't really have the 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 nut to uh, cut through a big tree very well. So you, that's something you want to you you might want to avoid. You want a bigger saw. Same thing with this though. You're probably not going to get to cut through a superly big tree either. But this would probably cut a medium grade tree versus this might cut a little like st stick cedar. That's probably about that round for the 210 but this one might be able to cut a tree that's slightly a bit bigger maybe about like that round maybe a little bit more maybe a little less i've never really tested it out like i said kind of just what i looked up but yeah so keep that in mind because you can overwork your saw and burn it out really quick you also want to make sure that under your and i'll show you here i don't know if you can see it but under your here is your filter uh, and you want to make sure all those passages are clear so if you get a saw like this and say you go to service it because it's unknown to you and you're servicing make sure you clean all that out get all the sawdust out from around the fins you know make sure all that area is clean because when you're working on when you have that in there what it'll do is it'll overheat get hot and burn on the fins and then you'll just have a whole mess of overheating in here and some meltage issues possibly if the le leaves or whatever that gets in there caught on fire so keep track of that because a lot of people who own chainsaws you know they'll clean them but say if their chainsaw goes to die when they're using it to uh buck up firewood or something they may not take it apart and just set it aside if they don't want to bother fixing it and then you have some people of course we uh any mechanic can attest to this people that just clearly don't know about maintenance of their equipment and just beat their stuff to death which is sad but it happens you get those few uh people that even though uh it, it's people that just aren't interested in mechanical and getting dirty so when they have something they just use it till it dies which is kind of a shameful even though you're not into mechanics i still think you should be aware of this and still do some little maintenance stuff or bring it to somebody to do the maintenance for you because it's only going to better the life of your equipment. It's going to last longer. Even if you don't want to spend the money. Because spending the money to have it serviced. Cleaned all the stuff out like that. And cleaned up. Degreased all that kind of stuff. Gone through the little things. Like changing spark plug. And making sure your fluids are still fresh. Same with like a four cycle engine. It's actually going to last you longer. And your maintenance bill won't be as expensive. If you think about it. If you constantly get it serviced every year. So keep that in mind for people who don't like to do this stuff and have stumbled across my video but may not necessarily be interested in uh, doing service work themselves keep that in mind that if you keep your equipment service take it to somebody to do all this you're never going to have that issues of breaking down and you're going to get a lot of years out of this equipment because i believe even though when it comes from the factory they tell you it's only rated to last for so long i believe you can get at least five to ten more years out of whatever they don't rate last as long because of of the maintenance that you have done to prevent from i was watching a youtuber the other day and he was uh working on a, a youtuber i really like working on a uh, uh stripping down somebody had a local i think uh in fellow engine mechanic or scrapper of some kind and knows that he likes stuff had gotten some junk uh, Vanguard or guard twin overhead valve uh, garden tractor engines and he decided to strip one down because one was smoking and one had blew a rod and when stripping it down there's classic proof right there of 
somebody just beating their equipment till it dies. My wondering is if they ran it low on oil, but apparently these newer ones have a thing called an oil shut off. Was what he was saying because it was a, like a newer used one from like 2000s. And apparently the, the shut off is supposed to tell you it's a low, low oil shut off and it's supposed to tell you when it shut off. But And he was pulling it apart and it didn't look like that malfunction. And usually it kicks off and, and I know some of the older stuff had something similar to that where like the 80s craftsman push mowers if if they were running low on oil they would not start at all so apparently something happened there that that oil shut off is not reading or something or a wear part that the oil shut off was not aware of because you could clearly see where the connecting where the connecting rod blew and somehow got hot and that's a sign of lack of maintenance on whoever had it obviously which is a shame, but it happens, you know. Some people just don't think about that. They beat them and beat them. And they may hear wear going on in there, but they don't know much about it. So they kind of just brush it off. And it's a shame because good equipment goes into the dust. Not that that was a really overly good tractor, probably, because of what it is. It's a used, probably out of a used Sears Craftsman or something like that. Cheapo. Uh, tractor like they make nowadays but even those cheaper ones you can keep around like i said if you do that so keep that in mind as well um, i figured i would share those little bits with you while i'm doing this but anyways uh now i'm gonna pull this adjustment screw out because i've kind of gone enough on that whole ranting deal so see if we can get this out of here and swap over pretty straightforward you're going to need a flathead screwdriver and a uh, wrench or a socket. And I believe this is a 3 8 but I'll let you know because it's the first time doing it. I'm going to use a socket wrench because I like using socket wrenches. They just work so much better. Uh, it's all personal preference, but... I just think a wrench takes forever to do a job, and I like to to take the less time as possible when I'm working on these. And just to clarify, it is a three eighths on the one that I'm. And let me double check this. Yep, that one too is also a three eighths. So the two ten correct adjuster is three eighths, and so is the McCullough. So they're basically swappable. Which the, I, I figured so because from what I read, these are the uh, interchangeable part. So, what you want to do is you want to get your flat head screwdriver, any kind will do. This medium grade tip is kind of working for me. As you can see, I use wooden handle screwdrivers, I just don't care for the modern plastic ones, but people say those are better. Um, the beauty about those, I feel, is not that you couldn't do it with a wood handled screwdriver but because of these so old and being what they are I hate to bead on the ends of them sometimes when when I could need to and that's the uh, beauty about having those plastic ones because they're not really that old if you buy them new at the thing you can be bead on them and not really care that much about ruining the handle of the screwdriver I will give it that but I think these wooden handle screwdrivers work really well and I recommend anyone just get an old wood handles because, A, when you go to a sale, you can sometimes find them really cheap because people want to get rid of them. And you're uh, saving money. And, B, I think it, it's, you know, and mainly just, uh, I think they're better quality made. But mostly, A, because you, you're saving money and you don't have to go out and buy new tools if you buy them at sale. That's why I like to buy tools up at sales that I can get real cheap because I think that, it, that they're just, uh, I think that they're just, uh, it's cheaper and they're better quality, a lot of these older tools. So keep that in mind as you're, as you're uh, collecting. Some people who are aware of what wood handle screwdrivers are might try to charge a little bit more because they looked up and this one might be valued at this and this. There are people who collect these old wooden handled screwdrivers because they have a whole collection of them, and if there's one that they don't have, they'll buy them. So I believe they're worth some money, but I think the highest I've ever, if 
if I remember correctly, looking on the internet, was some some type of brand that I guess is worth like upwards of fifty dollars for the foot handled screwdriver, or that's what it was going for on eBay. But I don't know. I I think that's a little, little pricey to me, no matter what it is, because in the end, it is just a screwdriver. But yeah, I I thought that was pretty like uh, that was pretty neat to know that that I guess apparently there are some pretty valuable foot handled screwdrivers. Um, just thinking of th just thinking of little things, side stories. Anyways, um, let's get back on this here. I'm almost done th on threading this, so. And if all of y'all, you know, start commenting about my story about the wood-handled screwdriver finding on eBay and think that's crazy too, I, I totally agree with you because that is nuts. I don't think I would ever pay $50 for a wood-handled screwdriver, but apparently that's what it got up to. And maybe there's something I don't know about that stuff that some collector does. But I, I have to honestly agree, too, if all y'all agree with me, I imagine you would, is that $50 is way too much for a, a dinky screwdriver. Especially if you're going to use the screwdriver and you're going to... See, I like, I like screwdrivers that I can use. You know, I like to take decent care of them, but I like to be able to use them, so I don't care what condition they're in. The wood could be slightly split when I find these wood-handled screwdrivers. I just like them because I like to be able to use them, and I don't have to go to a hardware store and save money. I don't think I'll ever get as obsessive as someone like that that would drive a screwdriver up to $50 because of it, some rarityness of it, because I, in the end, it is just a screwdriver. And I don't believe screwdrivers, in my opinion, are really worth that much. But some people see it different, I guess. Um, anyways, so just a little tip it there to you save money. Go into a sale. Just be aware of what you're buying too. Uh, if like they want outrageous prices like that, just just walk away because you know they're crazy. Most every tool I bought in the shop is actually from sales. I save money. Uh, once in a while I go out and buy new sockets when I need them. Not very rarely. Most of the time I get them at sales. I do have to invest in an impact gun. That's my next. One of my next hand tools that I want. Battery powered impact gun for my use in the shop that I'm going to buy at the hardware at some point. And also an abrasive blaster from Eastwood. Like I mentioned before in some of my previous videos, I definitely recommend getting one of those. But anyways, uh, I've almost got this off. So you're going to have to unthread this. But you might fight you towards the end a little. Because you have to get that little nub off there. And what that nub does that's on that threaded shaft for this is... Uh, I what pushes the bar back and forth to say you can spin the the nub i believe it is counterclockwise and it'll uh, push the bar back or clockwise and it'll push it forward so that's basically what that nub does and because these thread uh these uh screw bolts are so long it's going to take you quite a while uh or a little while to unthread it. Not super long, but be, especially if they've been in on there as long as this one has, it will tend to take a little longer. This one was tight at the end because it had been on there so long and some grease had gotten packed into the threads. Uh, I may or may not put some on here. I might, but I do recommend possibly put some Never Seize on there. And I think I might clean that off and just do that real quick. Put some of this stuff right here because it's it's always good to always good reassurement so if you ever have to take it back or anti-seize rather is what that says but never seize is basically the same thing anti-seize and this makes it easier so if you ever have to pull it apart again in the future that you can do so so i'm going to take a moment to clean those up to the shop rag and do that 
Not a sponsorship at all, but I believe it's Hefty Brand that makes these, but I'm not sponsoring them at all. But I highly recommend getting some of these Blue Shop rags. They're disposable, and they're just nice for the shop. If you can find bags of the, the cloth rags, those are good too. I do like those, but these Blue Shop rags work pretty good, and I tend to reuse them. Uh lot if I haven't got them super dirty I save them and reuse them versus grabbing another one but these I believe are made of a biodegradable material so they're better for the environment if you're gonna get disposable ones and I highly recommend them versus regular paper towel because these are made of like a different material if I remember correctly and they're a lot more durable than a paper towel is as you can see so the, the less splitting apart because the materials they're made of better for the environment too so highly recommend getting these blue shop rags so this is the nub I was uh, talking about that was st stuck on the shaft towards the end and this is the one that holds your there's a hole on your bar and it sits like this and goes down in the hole on your bar and it pushes it upwards so you get just the right amount of tension on this bar but like I said again you don't want this chain too tight but you don't want it sagging either because then the chain will just fall off catastrophe will happen but you don't want it too tight either so do keep that in mind when you're doing that how tight you put that at because too snug and you won't be able to spin the chain and if you can't spin the chain then the saw is going to have a hard time uh, too loose and the chain will be wobbling about and you could get seriously hurt doing that so set this here for now I have some pieces to put back on it so what I need to do now oh there's the piece I think I'm going to reuse this one with this just because not that it really matters but sometimes the thread these are uh, machine threads, so they, they're slightly different sometimes, oddly enough. So they may not work with one versus the other. I'm almost wondering, though, if this one, I don't think it is, but because it's not painted yellow unless somebody cleaned it off, that this might be a replacement uh, screw bolt just because it doesn't have the yellow factory because if you look here you can see the factory yellow that they just quickly sprayed on it in the factory and that does not have it which tells me it could be over time and that that's not odd at all because sometimes when they these uh, uh, threads wear out like I said or the, the uh, bolt breaks from people over tension and they just grab what they can but somehow they were able to make it work so that's pretty good kudos to them uh, this nub right here is not bad so I'm going to save that but the bolt is shot so at some point I can probably just I could just go search for a new bolt for this nub but I don't think I'm going to at some point I will get uh, another uh, uh, bolt uh, for a nub for this one Cause like I said, for the 1010, because like I said, I want to get the 1010 going. Um, so we're almost there as far as uh, getting this. This one came off a little easier, surprisingly, but of course the bolt was shorter too, because it had snapped. I think for now, so I don't lose this knob, I'll just thread it on there. And keep the two halves so now we want to set this in here and when you're doing this I'll show you in a minute but you want to make sure you adjust your uh, you want to make sure you adjust your your um, uh, nub to the right adjustment so it sits in the hole on the chain and I'll show you what I'm talking about here in a minute uh, just so it it meets up with that nub when you first sandwich 
the uh, chain and, and nub on there. So keep that in mind too. You want to make sure that stuff lines up. Definitely a novice at working on these, but Hopefully the ends of this aren't straight. They shouldn't be. No matter if I'm getting it back. Bear with me, YouTube folks. I'm just trying to. story time uh, I'm a, I got a story for you guys I think you might like um, I just thought of it now years ago um, I, I was servicing a person's mower actually I got two stories with you I'll tell you the one and uh, sat the first one I sat and puzzled why the uh, why it wouldn't start so I finally looked at it gave it a closer once over and turns out that uh, I don't know how they did it it was a push mower and it had a special like mounting bracket for the carb and would rattle when it started up and somehow they were they managed to break that that uh, mounting bracket how you do that I don't know they must have hit a gnarly sized stone I thought that was something and then the second time somebody brought me a carburetor and th this is true no joke uh, proof of how you can neglect your lawnmower apparently because some people do they brought me a uh, push mower and again it was another push mower and apparently it, it wasn't starting so and, and I was wondering why it wouldn't start. I've had the same problem with the garden tractor too. Uh, when I first bought it. The one that I'm doing for my nephews had a similar problem. But I th think this w was because the one for my nephews had sat out in the weather and had a little gas in it. But what they did is they had somehow lots of gas in their push mower. And uh, what happened... Is I pulled that carburetor apart because I said, well, it's got to be the carburetor. That's the culprit. I figured that out. And that carburetor was so corroded. I kept scraping and scraping at it. And finally, when I got it scraped enough, it wore a hole right through the, the carb. So luckily I had another carb there. But I told them about that afterwards. I said, you know, next time you might not want to uh, let your carb get to the point of where it's about to fall apart uh, where it's corroded so much that it corrodes a hole in it there's a true sign right there class of uh, uh, neglect for your mower uh, that was uh, definitely a you that was definitely something the funny thing is the guy had kept pulling and pulling on it he couldn't get it and he wondered why and so that's when he finally brought it into me because he saw that I did small engine, he said, I have one for you, because I saw your ad on Craigslist. Uh, probably not the best platform to use, but at the time, that's what I was using. And I would buy a lot of mowers from Craigslist. But anyways, it, it, it was just hilarious. And the guy brought it, and I checked it out, and uh, turns out that's what it was. And I told him all he needed was a new carburetor, and I didn't charge him very much for it because I kind of felt bad for him. But I told him in the future, you know, make sure that you drain your gas out of it and you run all the fuel out of, or run all the fuel out of the carb and put stable in it before you 
and, and run all the fuel out of your car and put stable in it before you put it away for the winter because you're going to regret that. And you're lucky that I was able to bring it back to life because I've seen some mowers that were so carboned up that I would get from uh, lack of maintenance with the plug and some carburetors that were so gummed because of the, the of that reason. And I thought it was kind of funny, you know. Not not necessarily funny, but, you know, kind of like, wow. That, that's proof that people can truly neglect. And it was a decent-looking mower. Not not much rust on it. Not that old either, I don't think. Just left it over winter and let the gas grow to carb. Uh... I feel like there's one other one I should tell you about. It's slightly different. And I'm trying to remember it because I just thought of it and then, then I lost it. But if it comes back to me, I'll tell you because, you know, I'll tell you a few story times while I'm trying to. This is going to take me a little bit, YouTube folks, so bear with me. I also have to do the idle adjustment on this saw, because that I'm still been trying to figure out. Uh, so, that's something I might do a video, another video on me doing the idle adjustment on this saw, but I don't know. Probably not, because I need to look at my phone. So I found the thing so I can remember how to s adjust them. I'm trying to get this saw working so I can cut some tree limbs down for my mother out in the backyard. So she doesn't bonk her head while she's mowing because she does a lot of the mowing. But she really likes to mow so I've let her do the mowing. You'd think I'd be the one mowing probably, right? And normally I would. But I also don't really... Uh, we got this uh, John Deere Zero turn that before my grandfather passed away he bought new or newish and it costed him quite a bit but I've never really been a big fan of the Zero turn because of the levers. I just think that's too confusing for my brain and a lot of people who have used Zero turns before are probably just going to laugh me in the bank. Oh you can't, you can't figure out how to use a Zero turn. And spin those levers, but for just for some reason, I'm just not very good at those. I, they, they just confuse me, and I prefer the old steering wheel job because that's what I'm used to. And I haven't done a whole bunch of run time on a zero turn, but I did one once in the past enough to like just boggle me. It, it was confusing to me, and I just didn't like it. So I told my uh, cousin who I was working for at the time. That I'd rather use the old steering wheel John Deere that he had from the 90s. That was his grandmother's. And he, luckily we were able to get that running so I could use that. He had a bigger wheel horse that would have been perfect. But it hadn't run in years. And, uh, so, the, we didn't really want to mess with that. He just assumed he used the John Deere. Plus the uh, wheel horse had a big giant rot hole in the deck. I've since acquired that tractor, but it's a surprise for him once I fix it up to go back to him because uh, story time, I was doing work for his father and, and him, and I really didn't expect to get anything because, you know, that's the way I am. I, I help out family need, but his father was insistent on giving me pay, and I said, don't worry about it to my uncle. And he said, nah, I got to do it somehow for you. So he said, how about I give you the tractor? And I said, if you really insist, because I didn't want to insult him. But I knew my uh, cousin wasn't too crazy about the tractor leaving because it was his dad's. And he kind of didn't want that his dad to do that. But I said, okay. Because I didn't want to insult him. So I take it. And little does my cousin know. I haven't told him yet, but... I do plan on restoring that tractor when I get around to it, getting it running, welding up the mowing deck where the hole is, and restoring the mowing deck cosmetically and going through it, and I'm going to give it back to him because it was his dad. But what I want to do is I want to put a uh, picture of his dad on there for him, that 
because his dad was sheriff in the town for quite a few years, so I want to put a picture of that up, of him. There's a special picture, and I, out of respect, I won't be uh, filming that for my YouTube channel, but I do want to, like I said, I do want to uh, put that picture on there for him once I've done all the paint work. I'm going to try to salvage the old decals because even though it's a 520 Hydro wheel horse from the 1990s, I, I think it's going to be hard to find decals because a lot of the wheel horse stuff has kind of just like gone by the wayside now since wheel horses ceased a ton of production. And a lot of the uh, dealers around here that deal in wheel horse sadly have uh, stopped dealing in a lot of wheel horse parts because wheel horses revamped a lot of their parts. Uh, the engine that, I think it's mainly because the engine that is in the wheel horse I have is an Onan and uh, Onan stopped making engines after a certain period of time but they still produced a lot of the parts and I think that for a while they were producing those parts but now Onan is trying to phase out of parts too as well so they can just button up their uh, they can just button up their operation and close down for good because Onan was hurting for money back in the 90s, sadly, which was like the last year runs for Onan. Onan is a good is a good was a good engine. They were just hurting for funds, I guess, so they had to close up shop. Sadly, which happens. Sometimes engine companies like that, the big ones, they just can't keep the doors open because it's just not feasible. Companies like Briggs and Stratton come in and take over and become the top leader dogs. And companies like these crop up once in a while that try to make a good quality engine but just can't afford. Uh, it, I guess in a way, it's kind of... Uh, I think it's a shame for Onan. On the other hand, another pr uh, prime example of where I hate to say it, I don't think it's a shame that they closed up is Tecumseh because of, uh, for all of you who are familiar with Tecumseh's, the uh, not wanting to go with the uh, safety emission standards of the modern times now that Tecumseh closed their doors back in about like 2011, uh, 2000 and 15 or something like that 2011 I forget exactly rightly so about time I mean I hate to say it but for all of you who have worked on Tecumseh's know what I'm talking about ornery little buggers and very hard to work on and all the parts have to be perfectly aligned and, and by the perfect millisecond and stuff like that just never been a big fan of Tecumseh's and if you accidentally don't put your uh, timing marks or something dead on on a Tecumseh or something like that it'll either run the timing backwards or just not run at all ever again and I can attest to that because my grandfather's cousin had a rototiller that was my grandfather's at one time that my grandfather traded for the forge in the background but anyways his cousin kept trying to mess and mess with that and he even asked me if I know of anything and I was throwing stuff at him because the timing was off on it. And I don't think he was ever able to get the timing fixed on that thing. But that's the problem with them. Sadly, is those Tecumsehs just are not that that good. Sucks, but that's Tecumseh power for you. They just don't like... Pumps of power, they just don't like to run very well. And I think that was a poor design on Tecumseh to make their engines so they only run one way. The early Tecumsehs aren't too bad, they're a little bit better, but the later Tecumsehs, the 70s and 80s Tecumsehs, are just pure. You, you take them apart and they're not put together right. The earlier, like I said, the earlier Tecumsehs from like the 60s weren't too bad because they were a little bit better. 
Uh, if you ever see them, I highly recommend staying away from them. The Troy Built Pony Rototillers with the Tecumseh. Other, and to me, they're just garbage engines. If, if you know what you're doing with Tecumsehs and you want to mess with it because for some weird reason you really like that tractor, I, I mean, I, kudos to you, but I would never mess with a Troy Built Pony if I don't have to because those, those, uh, those ones stink unless you get the earlier version with the Kohler on it. Those were the good ones, but the later Troy Built Ponies with the Tecumseh from the 80s. Uh, just undesirable, and I and I can, can honestly see why because they just run like like crud, and they're really they stink to work on, not fun to work on whatsoever. Because I've worked on one of those, and tell, let me tell you, it was not fun for me. I just felt bad for my grandfather's cousin because he couldn't ever get the timing on that bugger, and he messed and messed with it. But he was a tenacious guy. He really was, and I give him that. You know, he was tenacious. He he didn't quit. He was he was raised up in the school, in, in the old school ways where you didn't quit. You kept going no matter what. Um, I think this video is getting pretty long enough, and I'm still messing with this adjustment screw, as you can see. But you get the idea. It sits here. It goes on the nub. And when you spin that screw, it tightens up that chain. And I was going to show you all that, but it's taken me a while. And I bet this video is fairly long. I'm going to see how many minutes. And I think I'm going to end it there. I might do another video on the uh, adjustments of this. I can memorize them down. But yeah, this video is getting pretty long. So I think I'm going to end it there, YouTube folks. I want to thank you for tuning in. I hope this helps you in whatever way and hope you enjoyed some of my story times. I figured to make the video interesting I'd add some story times in there but that's pretty much swapping that over. And as you can see, look at right there before I, I leave this video. See that? That's where that nub's going to sit right there. That nub is going to sit right in this one right here. And you want to make sure you have this plate. This had two of these plates on there, but from what I looked up, you don't need that second. That second plate is not supposed to be there because the chain was not fully sitting with the bar. And then I looked it up, and it turns out that somebody had just put double there, so you only, you're only supposed to have one. But on this 210 versus the 1010, before I leave, you can see where the... Um, well, Where it's gonna sit and that's on there but anyways oh it's because of that bolt but it's these two holes right here line up with these two bolts and then of course you put your nut on there and you thread it down and tighten it and that's basically holding it on I hope this helps anyone who is doing one of these saws because I did not see much on this on YouTube I saw uh, one youtuber doing uh, if you want to put a longer bar on this saw but i highly recommend and and this person believes you can get away with it with if you update the clutch but i i do uh, i highly recommend you just staying with stock because you're better off with stock because sometimes if you run too big of a bar you can overheat the saw from what i read somewhere you you, you can do that sometimes if you're if you run them for too long with the bigger bar but if you are going to do that, like the person on YouTube I saw did, you would probably want to upgrade to the 3.5 clutch and not the 3.8 bar clutch. Or, or I believe is what they call it. So I w if, if that was the case, like I said, if you're going to go with a longer bar and you want some more nut for the saw, you're definitely upgrading the clutch to the 3.5 clutch and not the 3.8 clutch. Because... You, you'll if you put a bigger bar and chain on this, you might end up burning that that three eighths clutch. And I believe the three point five makes it go a little bit faster, but still, I I personally would just stay with stock because you can end up really doing some damage to your saw over time if you put a, a non factory bar size bar on there or a close to factory size bar on there and something that's oversized because. 
uh, when you put oversize and you start trying to cut down big trees, you're going to burn this saw up quick. These saws, like I said, are the, especially for this size, they're not designed for real big trees. This one's probably designed for this versus the 10. 10's got a little more nut, like I said, so it's designed for a slight bigger. But this 210, again, is just that. But anyways, YouTube folks, I hope this helps you in some way. And I hope that I've given you some helpful tips. I will see you in the next video. And uh, thank you so much for viewing in. For those of you who have viewed into my my videos. And um, if you're new to the channel, if you wouldn't mind, please, as always, subscribing to my YouTube uh, channel, if you would, please. And hitting that notification bell. The subscribe button somewhere here. And the notification bell should be somewhere up there. And then also, uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind commenting below, you can comment with any kind of comment you like. But especially if you wouldn't mind, please, if you dislike my video, as always, so I know how to make it better. Because I'm a person that feels the need to improve on my videos. So if I do get a dislike on my videos, I would like to know why. So I can make my videos better for the viewer. Because I want to make my videos viewer-oriented. Videos of stuff that I am interested in that also intrigues my viewers and gets my view viewers coming back to watch. So, also look for some more updates on that no-name brand radio that I was working on. And I'm going to try to find some screws that will work for the tuners to see if I can bring that radio back to life, uh, hopefully. Um, so, anyways, as always, keep your heads up, stay strong, all that kind of jazz. Have an excellent time, whatever it is, wherever you are. And sunshine, unicorns, and rainbows. Thank you so much, and bye for now.